Welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, before we get started, uh, we found glasses um, under one of the seats. Anyone? Um, okay, we'll leave them here just in case. Um, make an announcement again in a few minutes. Welcome back um, to our afternoon event, a workshop entitled Methodologies of Restructuring and Reclaiming. Uh, it's led by two people, and I'm going to introduce them now. Lillian Posadas, Repatriation and Community Research Manager at the Autry Museum of the American West. Lillian is interested in the ethical development and sustainability of collaborative research and collections management and their relationship to institutional policies. Lillian focuses on building systemic institutional change in support of repatriation collections, care, and access, and representation and diversity initiatives. She serves on the advisory board for the Mellon Opportunity for Diversity and Conservation, the advisory board for the local community organization Gender Justice LA, and is working alongside Autry staff to establish a permanent cultural equity and inclusion committee at the Autry Museum. And our second uh, presenter for the workshop today is Pamela J. Peters. She's an indigenous photographer from the Navajo Reservation. Her Diné um, first clan is Tachitni, Red Running Into the Water People. Pamela's multimedia photography and video work explores her vision of what she calls indigenous realism, which examines the lives and complexities of contemporary American Indians. Her work pushes viewers to critically analyze the psychological and historical structures underlying the representation of Native Americans in mass media. As a Navajo living in the city, she has experienced firsthand the social impact of the negative, inaccurate, and insulting images of stereotyped American Indians still seen in film and television, and she is inspired by her mission to counteract those stereotypes. The portraits she takes are imbued with the indigenous participants living today, not inhabiting some cliched pre-modern past, and she focuses on American Indians in Los Angeles. Her photography has been featured at the Los Angeles Center of Photography, Arts District Los Angeles Photo Collective, These Days Gallery, Venice Arts Gallery, The Main Museum, and featured in the Los Angeles Times, Reuters News, Cowboys and Indians Magazine, Indian Country Today, and American Indian Quarterly Journal. Most recently, uh, she exhibited at the Triton Contemporary Museum in Santa Clara and Glendale Reflect Space Gallery at the Glendale Downtown Central Library. So please join me in welcoming our two uh, leaders for this workshop today. Um, I'm going to introduce myself in Navajo, which I usually do. Yat Esh, Pamela Peters, and Shia. Tachini Nishla, Lashi Bashishin, Tohadlini Dashiche, Ado Kidlishini Dashanele, Kutago Nazahishle. I do this because I want to share and also acknowledge the existence of my ancestors, and my, through my language, I'm able to do that and to, for them to see me here in this setting today. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for, oh, this is loud, um, <laughs> for inviting us to, to do this workshop. Uh, we're going to be venturing into a little bit of history and, and, and a lot about just what's going on now in museum collections and in initiatives at museums to work with communities. And Pamela, of course, is going to discuss a variety of different topics around, around um, representation and narrative. Uh, but to start, I did, I did want to uh, name one uh, one important detail is that I am, I officially am not representing the Autry at this, <laughs> at this right now, which allows me to be critical of elements that, um, uh, and to pull from a variety of experiences that I've had over the years and to discuss things that uh, myself and others are advocating for at the Autry but are not yet uh, you know, part of the institutional structure. Uh, so I just want to mention that. Um. These are three, three of the parts that we wanted to discuss today, um, why we're addressing um, narratives and the importance of changing narratives. Um, historically, we've known that narratives have always navigated with the white patriarch ideology. And through the work that I've been working with, um, our history has been erased. 
Native American history has been erased. It's been erased um, that's manifested through the education system that has been incorporated and um, celebrated in film and television and through mass media, um, through toys and um, everything that um, you can pretty much commodify today in society. And so that was basically the root of why I felt it was important to make these changes and show a um, direct narrative directly from a Native American standpoint, from a, from a Navajo woman, from a tribal individual. And um, we've, we've always had our stories um, told with this broken moral compass is kind of how I define it um, throughout history. And um, I think most of you guys know that, but um, it, it's very different when you hear it directly from a, a Native person saying this and how destructive it can be, um, both um, psychologically and um, personally. And, you know, as an individual living here in Los Angeles, I've experienced every aspect of a stereotype ever known um, about Native Americans. And so that's what pushes me. And that's my drive for me to make the changes in um, the work that I'm doing. So historically, it's because of the white um, stories that have been told about us. So um, before I jump into some of the history of the institution uh, pictured here, the Southwest Museum of the American Indian, I want to ask how many people here are familiar with that museum and that collection? OK. Um, so I think it's interesting in that we're talking about missions that much of the architecture of the Southwest Museum is modeled after um, mission architecture, yet it's a museum. And a museum that was very much a colonial institution and a collection that was built out of colonial uh, frameworks and ambitions with the, the um, presumption that, and a very secure presumption that indigenous peoples were going to eventually disappear and there was, going, there was this thirst to just collect as many items as possible as these sort of relics of, of, of uh, a people that were going to, to disappear. And even if people did not disappear, if culture changed, then there, was, there were all of these arguments about authenticity and people are no longer truly indigenous. Um, and, and so collectors were, particularly Charles, Charles Lummis, were, were collecting items to fill up this um, institution that captured moments of, of, uh, of indigenous life. And um, one of the reasons why I'm starting here is not only to acknowledge that colonial history, but to acknowledge that a lot of the collecting that happened was under duress, under extreme duress. We have, when we start looking, when I start looking at the archives, there's a lot of evidence for people collecting uh, items that they pursued from an individual year after year after year, and that individual saying, no, I'm not giving you this drum, no, I'm not giving you this dress, no, I'm not giving you, you know, whatever. And then uh, people, then, uh, are, are starving and are able to, and then have to trade these items, these precious items for something like a can of beans. And these are listed in the archives and they're tied very directly to the provenance of the objects in many of these institutions, particularly these older uh, collections that are over 100 years in the making. Um, and so it, it, uh, it puts us in an interesting situation where uh, we need to do something about that. Like we can't just sit on that history. And I think yesterday someone mentioned um, the need to question ourselves, like what can we do now? What should we be doing to move forward? And so I think we're going to touch a little bit on like what can we do? What are we doing now? What questions should we be asking ourselves? And um, how can we address these co uh, colonial practices, which not only did they, did they involve collecting, but they also involved telling other people's stories and often telling them in incredibly, <laughs> incredibly erroneous ways, just um, and fueling stereotypes that had a real material impact on indigenous people in California? Um, one of the aspects we were going to discuss too is how policies are created and without really understanding how um, the history of native peoples, how native peoples don't have a say in policies. And the relationship we have with um, the United States government is that all these policies were created um, they pretty much manifested from the Indian Wars that happened. And um, from that, we had the boarding school era where we were told you know, that we can't speak our language and we can't have our culture. And so those were policies that were enforced into the education system at, as young adults. And then that was 
created into these termination policies. And the termination policies um, were about Native Americans and about us um, being self-sufficient. And one of, the, one of the policies that I really focus on is about the relocation program from 1956. And I use that particular policy as part of my work in talking about the relocation program and how American Indians have a story of migrating here to Los Angeles and we have an existence, we have a historical um, narrative of coming here to the city. Um, so those are some of the policies that are st still manifesting today. Um, we've had um, our land still continuing to be um, taken. And it's important to understand how this whole structure of how like the racism is created. I, I always say that, you know, for me, racism isn't a feeling, it's more of a structure that was created. It was a structure to put us in a certain tier, um, uh, alienate us from um, actually from society. And when that evolves, that's when these policies are created. And I'll let yeah, and so I'll Lilliam you. carry on for some of the policies from a um, museum standpoint. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about the policies um, from within museums, is that when you have an institution that's um, rooted in a colonial framework, the policies that emerge from that institution are going to be highly problematic. And so we're, what we're doing at the Autry now is a addressing that and recognizing that it's important to acknowledge that history very openly and very transparently and to look at the policies that emerged from this early um, development of museology in the United States. The Southwest Museum was a huge um, driver of, of, of how that practice developed in this country. And, uh, and take a real critical lens at how we do things, how we manage collections, how we manage collections access, who we open the collections up to, uh, who, you know, and what the kinds of researchers that we allow into the space, into these spaces. Um, so some of these policies will start to affect a variety of different researchers. And it's not unique to the Autry, but we're, we're uh, um, being um, very proactive currently in developing a, a system that will uh, require in many, in, in, in great sense, that scholars who are looking at materials that are directly connected to indigenous peoples need to be working directly with indigenous peoples. And if they are not, then we cannot grant you access. And that's in order to correct this colonial history where other people have been historically telling the stories of indigenous people without their involvement whatsoever. And we have many, and not only do we think that this is a, a necessary corrective measure, but that it's, it's a, it's, there's a responsibility there to ensure proper um, and accurate scholarship. We have encountered many stories over the years in speaking with um, indigenous community members uh, where they have, in collaboration with museums over the years, have reviewed collections and have met with students who have spent four or five years writing up a dissertation on a collection of items and research that's been um, written about many of these items, only to find out that it's all wrong. No one ever talked to the community. And then here comes someone and says, this is not at all what this is. <laughs> and that is, a, it's, you know, it's, it's a, we need to be responsible also to ensure that um, we're, for being uh, accurate. Um, the third tier that we're gonna um, also discuss is about um, narratives. Um, a lot of people don't understand or even can fathom the fact that there are over 576 federally recognized tribes. That is federally recognized and then you count the non-recognized tribes, which there's over 100, 200 tribes that are still trying to get federal recognition. And people don't understand that there's also over 150 languages still spoken today. And that's why I feel like for me as a native, you know, as a Navajo woman, it's important for me to share, you know, my language in a public setting so people can start to understand that there's more tribal languages spoken. Even like yesterday, I was really, happy to see one of the participants um, speaking his, his tr tribal language. I think it's beautiful. I think we should celebrate the diversity of, of, of all the cultures as opposed to just um, generating it as just as one. Um, I think understanding that, understanding these narratives from all these different tribal communities, it can start setting in place that there is 
there is understanding of who we are as tribal people, and maybe that's when these changes um, with policies and with um, acknowledgement. And I, I, it's also important for our land acknowledgement, and I'm very thankful that you addressed that at the beginning of the of the conference and recognizing the Tongva people that this is um, Tavangar um, territory. And I do that um, subconsciously at every event that I go to as I make sure to acknowledge the Tongva people, that this is their land base and they do have a language. And um, I'm fortunate enough that I know tribal Tongva people and I'm learning a little bit of their language as well. And I think it's, it's respectful in that sense. And Respect is important. Respect is important into making these changes. Respecting people um, that we're talking about in these narratives um, is very important. Okay, you want to go to the next slide? Yeah. Let's see. All right. So, looking back at museums, I think one of the things I mentioned a little bit about museum practice uh, and earlier, but to expand on that, so much of what we have in museums from California in the, in the Southwest Museum collection are, is simply labeled Mission Indian. And that could be anybody. And there's no mention of the artist. There might be mention of a scholar that studied the, the, the piece, but it's, uh, it, it, it doesn't really give us much. It's, and so we're starting to acknowledge these items, as, these records as impoverished records um, that are very much deserving of attention, of, uh, of research, of resources, and of really truly starting with connection to communities, working with California indigenous communities to gain access uh, to many of these collections and start to identify um, who these baskets, for example, belong to. And it's all it takes in many instances is one visit by someone and the people can right off the shelf identify like that's my grand grandmother's basket. You know, and that's what that design means, and this is how it was made, and this is where it was made, and there's so much information there, but for a long time, no one's been engaged. Like, it, it, researchers and museum um, curators have not been engaging these communities, to the, and it's, it's, uh, it's led to what I, I liked, I, I wanted to use this image, because it's, it's almost as though they're not even there. There's no information really tied to, to many of these items. So the, the richness is, is uh, can only be obtained through a direct relationship and, and work, working relationship with indigenous communities. And this, um, I wanted to bring up how many of the collections, not only are they described in the, in the database as specimens, um, but they're often historically been displayed as specimens. And like a, a, a study through the material culture of indigenous peoples um, and looking at indigenous peoples as, as a specimen to be studied. And rather than uh, looking at uh, people as artists or looking at the work as art itself. Um, and uh, I find that, troublingly, that's an attitude that's still incredibly pervasive today. I encounter people, <laughs> unfortunately, on a very regular basis who will, upon meeting an indigenous person, will immediately start asking that individual questions before they introduce themselves. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're, Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's true. I'm sure you've come across it, like, you know, and it's something that we all need to be very critically self-aware of. How are, what power do we have as researchers, as scholars, as museum practitioners? How are we wielding that power? Um, in what ways do we need to be uh, responsible and accountable um, to, the, uh, to indigenous peoples whose materials we work with? I think also, you know, she she works she works in a museum setting and I actually um, was part of the museum as well. I I did photography. I took um, I helped them with their digital um, collection about 10, 15 years ago at the Southwest Museum, and I for me as a native as a for a native woman we, I mean we have. We have ways of how we, I guess, how can I say this? We have ways of how we conduct ourselves when we do, when we're across um, different artifacts of our ancestors. And there was a room I remember that they had and I could feel the energy and I, I told them, I said, you know, and they, they were like, oh, you're gonna take f the, some of the photos in, in this room. And I said, I don't know if I can do that. And I said, I, I have to, 
you know, know a little more of why, you know, what was in the room. Come to find out, it was actually some of the ancestors that were in the room. And I had to talk to my mother, and she told me, she goes, well, you know, if you're going to be in that setting, make sure to take some tobacco. And um, just, you know, also to protect yourself. And it was very hard for some people to understand. Some did. They were respectful of, of understanding my concern. But in those little, those little aspects, I think it's good to acknowledge and just take a moment as a non-Native to just step back and say, OK, I will listen and I will hear. And I will respect your wishes on what you want and how you can continue to do your job, your task, and what you're doing. And, and you know, just really understanding that respectful um, place, especially in, a, in an institute where we, as Native people, we've always been defined as a collection. And I think it's important to understand that is to say, you know what, let's take, a, let's take a step back, let's listen, let's understand. We may not completely understand, but let's try to understand you know, what they're saying and to respect their wishes of what they want in order to work with us. I think that's important. Um, I know I got off a little topic there. <laughs> um, for me, I, I, I do, um, narratives, I do storytelling. Um, I think it's important for me, I do it subconsciously um, to focus on the contemporary placement of who we are as, as, as Native, as um, Indigenous people. Um, for so long, the storytelling that has been done has been done, um, we've, been, we've been looked upon as research, as opposed to being participants in these projects and these narratives. And that is one core of what I do in, in my work is I want, I, I don't like calling um, the people that I work with subjects. I call them participants and I call them my relatives. And I think just even with wording, the way you, you, you communicate to individuals, you know, just be very cautious of the words you use as opposed to saying subjects, as opposed to saying, you know, um, Indian woman, Indian man, and defining you know different people, um, because we've been we've been subjugated to this one identity, and for me, throughout my work, I want to celebrate the diversity of who we are as tribal people, and um, yeah, that's where I am. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely, words are. Very, very powerful. And, I, and speaking of that, um, ancestors, when, and referring to the ancestors, we're talking quite literally about uh, ancestral human remains that are in the museum collection. So indigenous peoples have very literally been used as specimens for research. And the Southwest Museum collection does have several individuals uh, present. And um, they, just to, just to highlight uh, for California, there were cemetery laws in place in the 1850s, and then uh, additional laws were put in place in the 19, early 1900s, um, instructing how, what was a cemetery. Uh, in, if there were six bodies or more, that would be designated as public cemetery, and there were protections for those spaces. Um, should they be vandalized, there were punishments for those, for, for, uh, those crimes. And in the early 1900s, there were laws um, created to regulate the movement of, of of uh, burials should be due to development or due to earthquakes or so there was an awareness very much that that burials and um, those burial areas cemeteries needed to be respected but none of those laws apply to indigenous people we didn't actually start to have um, <laughs> any kind of like impl imp legal implementation of, a, of, of a forcing people to have respect for indigenous burials until 1990 until the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Well, in addition to that, with the termination policies that they had, there was that trust relationship that they had, the land, that who, the, who owned that particular land, and it was actually given back to the government. Um, that was part of, of the government saying that, you know, you're not, you're not occupying this land anymore, so we're going to take it from you. Not knowing that... <laughs> 
maybe that land base was 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 protected because their ancestors lay there, and um, that's another part that I think a lot of people don't understand is about the land base. Um, I also think it's very interesting that with all the UC systems, there were all um, burial sites for a lot of the traditional Tongva people, and that's why the traditional Tongva people have a strong resistance with a lot of the UCs here because they were on their ancestral land mm -hmm. and where their ancestors lay. Mm -hmm. So I just want to bring that yes, up. Yes, no, of, of, of course. Uh, and so it's uh, coming back to the value of, of language and the importance of that. Um, it, that's why we, we, use, we, we choose to use the word ancestors because it, again, brings back the humanity rather than this you know, this subject. idea of it being subjects for specimens. And then, um, can I move on to the next one? Yeah. No, 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 not yet. Right. Oh, but also when, when we talk about belongings, when we talk about collections, we start to, we've been trying to refer to them as belongings, as things that are actually connected to people. People own these things, people use these things. They're not just items for research, but they're actually part of, of many people's uh, lives. Well, just to add on to that, when we talk about with the education and talking about how the education system is giving very little um, understanding of who we are as tribal people, um, you teach young kids about these little fantasies of Thanksgiving, and it progresses into them believing that these costumes, Indian costumes, are okay because it's all just a fantasy. It's a, the, these simple narratives of teaching Thanksgiving and uh, you know teaching young kids about the mission system they're simplistic narratives and so these young kids don't understand the the deep understanding of what these narratives have created and then that manifests into these adults that think it's okay to don a headdress and go to a sporting event and celebrate the death of our existence. And that's how I see um, these young adults going into um, sporting events when they're wearing a headdress. And a headdress has, a, it has deep meaning and it has a deep context to a particular tribe. You know, there, there's a ceremony that happens when, when one is giving, given a, a headdress. It has a significant meaning behind it but because of our education system teaching these young kids these simple um, relic narratives to these young kids to say, you know, it's okay. It's okay if we celebrate Thanksgiving this way. It's okay if you dress up as an Indian um, for Halloween. And then that manifests into them thinking it's okay. And when they are challenged with their actions, they get angry because they don't understand it because that ideology of an Indian is, 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 is embedded into their brain cell that it's, it's okay. And they don't believe that they're doing anything wrong, but in reality, they are. They're hurting a lot of people, and that manifests into what is happening in our tribal communities and how young kids are not seeing themselves. And they see the shame that's happening with how society sees them. And that's why you see a lot of young kids hanging themselves on reservations. And it's such an epidemic. And you see the cases of the murdered and missing indigenous women. I have friends that have died, brutally have been killed. I have relatives that have hung themselves because they felt like they weren't, they don't exist. But this is all a structure that has been created since co the, co the colonizers have come here. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of erasure happening there. The erasure of existence of, of, of people. And unfortunately it is something that we're, you know, we come across often when um, in trying to institute these new policies where we're asking researchers, if you want to access these items, tell us how you're working with the community. And there's pushback um, occasionally, fortunately not too often, uh, where people will have said things like, I, 
sure, that sounds great. That sounds great to want to work with community, but none of these people exist anymore. Who am I supposed to contact? You know, or all of these people are no longer um, you know, organized in a fashion that I can find uh, someone with authority to grant me permission. That's, and when, I, when those requests come to me, that's an immediate no. <laughs> like, no, there's no way I'm gonna let you look at something when you don't even believe the people have, have, are, are still here. And oftentimes it's as simple as a, as a Google search and, and you can find the, the tribal office that you should be contacting, that you should be um, uh, connecting with and the people you need to be working with. And so there's, and there's so many incredible indigenous scholars that, that uh, we all should be working with when we're, when we're engaging in topics that have historically directly impacted indigenous communities. And when we don't, we're, we're erasing this, we're erasing them. We're, because it's like, if, if, if I recognize that you're here and you're valuable and you're connected to these histories and I'm going to work with you, right? Um, and if I don't work with you, then it's, I'm just ignoring your, your existence and the validity of your experience. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that, in, in a, in a, you know, maybe in the great scheme of things, and maybe it's a small thing that we're trying to do at the Autry as on, in our end, imposing policies that um, will at least, the very least, have researchers pause and consider how it is that they're doing their, their research and with whom. More, so more, more of the things that we're trying to do, um, we have an incredible number of, of, uh, of objects. Um, we have 14,000 uh, baskets, thousands of which are labeled simply mission. Uh, we have several textiles, that's the room of, uh, with uh, textiles, and, um, and the vast majority of these items have never been viewed by the community. So for the first step is, um, at least for me, <laughs> and in advocating for this at, the, at this institution is that uh, before we open up the collection to anyone, the community uh, that's culturally affiliated with these objects needs to view those objects first and make sure that we are uh, treating objects that are culturally sensitive, that are perhaps um, were looted from burials uh, with the sensitivity and the care that they deserve and perhaps um, uh, go through the process of repatriation if that's something that they're interested in. And that we also have the proper information um, in our databases and that we have had conversations about how that information should be managed and, uh, and accessed by researchers or, or even other tribal members. Um, I'll take the second one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with reclaiming narratives, again, I'm just gonna reiterate what I'm doing through my, my multimedia work. Um, as a multimedia artist, I make sure to bring in um, different tribal communities and I have them be the voice and I show a lot of my photos in a contemporary context. I did that actually, um, I started because I studied a lot of um, Edward Curtis's photos. I have this love-hate relationship with Edward Curtis. Um, I love the fact that he has this huge collection of American Indians. Um, If, if, if it wasn't there, I don't think people would understand who we are. Um, I think sometimes we can use that, we can use his context of collecting to counter his narrative of what he tried to do. And that's what I'm doing through my photography, is I'm showing a contemporary American Indian um, in the context of today, but I'm also sharing their tribe, I'm also letting them get, you know, speak um, of who they are as a tribal person. But one thing I, I, I'm always making sure to do that um, Edward Curtis never did is I want to identify the tribe and the name. Because through his collection, he's only identified Indian as Indian woman, um, tribal woman. And he, he set them up in a way that he wanted to share his narrative, his white um, narrative of Indians as a relic past because he was hired by the United States government to collect um, images of American Indians because the government at that time thought we were gonna be extinct. And um, because of that, I think he 
thought it, would, it wouldn't matter if we gave them a name or an identity. So um, I think, and I, I like to think that he just probably did that because um, he was in a rush. <laughs> and um, You're being very generous. I know I am being very <laughs> generous. But I make sure to add the name of, of all the people that are in my photography because they are participants, they are my relatives, and they're my relations. And one of the projects that I started is called um, Indian in the City. And I use the word, um, I'm reclaiming a word, Indian. And I spell it N-D-N as opposed to Indian are the racist um, term of Indian that was um, celebrated in Western Western films, you know, go get that engine. And it was a derogatory term. And then we have Indian, which is um, the term that they use, American Indians, with the relationship we have with the United States government. Um, I came across Indian, N-D-N, um, about 15 years ago. I was watching my um, cousins doing some, um, I guess, graffiti <laughs> in the desert, which I still love that they do. Um, but I saw that and I was like, what is that? And they're like, oh, well, that's who we are. We're Indians. And I was like, what? I've never seen that. And they're like, we're not Indians. We're not Indians from, 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 from India. We're Indians. And this is who we are. And I was just like, <laughs> so excited to see this new term and this new um, identity that these young kids were um, celebrating. So I use that in my work and it's a way of how um, these young kids are fighting against the colonize of how we are identified as Native Americans, as tribal people, so. And so, um, we are, at the Autry, one of the things that several of, of, of uh, uh, the staff that are advocating for is to involve artists more directly in, in the research of collections and acknowledging artists themselves as researchers. And, uh, and not only as researchers, but also as people who can lead and organize programs involving collections. So last year, uh, we held the um, California Intertribal Basket Weavers Association meeting at the Autry Museum. And we, uh, the, they were in charge of all the programming. We were me merely the site, but we did open up the collection to the board, uh, of the, of the collection of baskets, so that folks could view baskets, could, could you know, critique baskets and share information. and. Um, that relationship has been uh, developing um, ever since, and we're hoping that we can continue to develop programming where artists, indigenous artists, can can lead the content and can have direct access to collections and can utilize those collections in their programming. Uh, one example is uh, well, I guess we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but yes, but it's uh, so it's an just all to say that it's important to involve artists directly um, and. Museums are often thought of as spaces for um, people who are not indigenous, not only the, the, uh, the ways in which exhibitions are curated, they're often curated um, for white audiences. It's, it's still a thing, definitely. I'm in many, I mean, sometimes in curatorial meetings, I'm just like, like, who is this for? You know, what, what are we, who are we trying to educate? And it's very clear we're trying to educate <laughs> white audiences and because there's this, this assumption that people of color or indigenous people don't go into museums, which is, which is ridiculous, or that we don't work in museums. So, uh, there's a, so there's also practices that we're putting in place internally for staff um, who don't want to scroll through a record and suddenly see um, ancestral remains on the on the page of their on the you know on the first on the screen of their computer, um, but recognizing that we're in the museum also like people of color indigenous people are are working in these spaces that these indigenous people are scholars indigenous people are are um, museum practitioners museum prof professionals. Um, there, I'm going to go back to the reclaiming of narratives. There's one thing that I usually do when I. Um, do a presentation. I usually do it in a whole setting, and I share some of my work, um, my video work too, which a lot of my video, um, I'm actually going to show one at the end of our presentation. But when you Google Indian, 
the first thing that pops up is that relic Indian, and it's mostly of Edward Curtis. And that aspect in a, in a, in a social network, in a, in a um, growing technology, I really want to change that. And there are many artists that I know that are trying to change that. We're trying to reclaim and restructure our narratives where we can say, this is who we are. Um, that was one, re one of the reasons why I really try to reinforce the term Indians. Because if you do, if you do a Google search with N-D-N-Z, you'll get a completely different view. You'll get a contemporary um, view of what Indians are. And you do that also in, um, with Instagram. And I guess it's just kind of like, I really want to like market that term. And so I use that in my, all of my work. Um, I did my first project about the relocation of American Indians coming to Los Angeles because I wanted to give um, a narrative to who we are as Indian people. We do have a migration story to Los Angeles. We've had, I've, I've seen all these stories told about um, the Asian migration, about the African American, about even the, the Mexican Americans, but we don't hear any story about the migration of American Indians. And actually there's, there's three different phases of the migration of Indians that, that happened throughout history. The first one that um, started with, with the, the birth of um, the Hollywood films back in the 1920s and then in the policies of the termination policies of 1956. And then you had um, the growth of the one film that seemed to personify what Indian was. And that brought a lot of Indians to Los Angeles too. And I'm sure you guys know what film that is. Dances with Wolves. And that brought a lot of Indians to Los Angeles as well, um, back in the early, 19, um, early 1990s, which um, is really an interesting story to, 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 um, to share. But um, that's what my, my, my first project is about. It's called The Legacy of Exile Indians, and it's about the migration of American Indians coming to Los Angeles. The second project I worked on is called um, Real Indians Retake Hollywood. And it's a collection of photography that I um, took of current tribal actors. And I placed them in a classic settings of Hollywood icons. And they were dressed up as Audrey Hepburn, Ava Garter, Elvis Presley. And you took, you look at these photos and you look at it in a different context. And I did that purposely because I want people to see us and, it, and, and see us in a different way as opposed to what Hollywood was doing by portraying us as the savage Indian, the relic Indian, the, the, um, all the stereotypes, the tropes that were created from Hollywood films. And so I wanted to bring a realization of who we are and also, um, showcase that there, there are talented um, contemporary Native Americans from tribal communities here in Los Angeles. And so that's some of the, the narratives that I'm telling. And um, I hope you, you, know, you guys check it out. My work is online. Um, yeah. yeah. And a lot of, a lot of the, the mythology around, the, the, around indigenous communities in the United States and the American West didn't just emerge from nowhere. It, a lot of it was taken from what was in museums like the Southwest Museum. <laughs> you know, and a lot of the papers that were written by anthropologists and, and by early museum curators and, and collectors. And, um, you know, and so it's an important to, to recognize the impact of, of research and how research is done. It, 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 has a way of trickling into popular culture and then affecting the lived experiences of people. I'm just going to counter all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a program where we did, um, it was a very successful program um, at the Autry where we l had a Melissa Cody, who's a, a fourth generation Navajo weaver, master weaver, uh, 
organize in partnership with us a, a program that would connect um, the community in Los Angeles with this weaving practice. And it was free, it was intergenerational. Um, that's actually a, a museum staff person to the right there with the plaid. And uh, we're, we want to continue to, doing, to do more of these kinds of programs um, and recognize that there are very, you know, there's incredible indigenous artists, uh, incredible indigenous scholars, sometimes the line between those is very blurred, and, um, and recognize the ways in which the, the ways in which we, we have a responsibility at the museum um, be, to address the harms that we've done in the way that we present it and the ways in which we've told indigenous stories. Uh, and artists have had a very interesting way of inserting their history, inserting their voice, inserting themselves into spaces where they've been erased. So um, we're definitely encouraging folks at the Autry and in other spaces to, to work directly with artists as a really val as valuable part of a, a just vitality of an institution and of, and of programming. Participation, that is very big on what I hope you guys um, walk away from this is that we just want to be part of the discussion of, of what we've gone through, the atrocities that we've gone through. We want, we want even though we know that there's, that there's many things that happen to tribal communities, we have so much knowledge that we could share. Um, we just want to participate in the conversations, in the narratives. Um, and those are, those are aspects and, and ways that we can make changes. Um, we just want participation. I mean, when you discuss about um, our sites, um, when you discuss about um, the mission systems, just acknowledge it at the beginning, saying, you know, this, is, th this was part of the territory of this tribal community. But then just reiterate it at the end, um, as opposed to erasing us completely through the dialogue of, um, of the research you guys do. Um, I think that's really important, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, you know, every, every institution has its culture, and uh, there's been many um, significant changes at the Autry Museum changing the institutional culture, where curators are now taking uh, more of a role as being facilitators uh, and working with various community uh, artists rather than leading the exhibition with solely their voice. Um, but it's a, 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 it's, a, it's a struggle, you know, it's a, to, to, to change institutional culture. And one of the things that I try and um, tell people, uh, you know, where there's still, you know, some hesitation in, in how people work with indigenous communities or some anxieties around maybe um, making mistakes is you're gonna make mistakes. Like we're all gonna make mistakes. If there's one thing for certain is we're gonna screw up again and again and again. And the important thing there is just to remember that uh, this is all a learning experience. And if the goal is to get better and to improve our practice and to increase our ethical uh, practice and um, we need to listen and we need to take a step, step back. We need to not take things personally. We need to not get defensive and we need to just, okay, create spaces where uh, our structures, where it's, it's uh, feedback is welcome or critique is welcome so that we can truly change the culture of these spaces, change how we do the work and the outcome of that work. Yeah, we can, we can change these structures as opposed to just walking, um, Visualizing a project in a narrow sense is to, you know, think outside the box, bring some participation of natives into your discussion of whatever talk, topic you're 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 um, addressing. Um, there's easy ways you can do that. Most importantly, what I I personally use um, is land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgement is so important, and it's easy to do. Just acknowledging the tribal people in the area that you are facilitating your work. Um, there's, uh, you know, there, there's so many, there's so many things that are evolving. There's, um, um, I, I guess I can give a couple examples of, of some of the changes some, some institutes are doing. Like for instance, my tribe, um, 
we've we partnered with um, Disney um, a, a couple years ago, where we wanted to really um, share to our youth the importance of our language, and so we had this um, language um, revitalization program, and our museum. Um, on the Navajo Nation decided to partner with Disney and said, hey, we really want to do something creatively and also teach to our youth the importance of our language. So we dubbed Star Wars in the Navajo language and we dubbed Finding Nemo in the Navajo language. So you have these two different um, eras where you had these elders that were laughing hysterically when they were watching Star Wars. <laughs> because if you understand <laughs> our language, I mean, the way we can, we, we, our words have evolved. Like we don't have a, a term for computer in Navajo. Life our lifesaver, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so you, we, we identify it as the, the firing stick. And so when you hear that, it is hysterical. <laughs> and so you had all these elders laughing about it. And then you have these kids just like enthralled with what they were seeing and, and learning at the same time about their, their traditional um, Navajo language. So there's ways to do it. I mean, if Disney can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> Oh, so th these are two photos from um, two of the projects that I've worked on. The first one I mentioned um, was the Legacy of Exile Indians. Um, I took this back in 2012, and I was inspired by a film that I saw called The Exiles. Um, it was a film that this... Um, film student at USC, Kent McKenzie. And he, he wanted to um, showcase something about the Native American experience back in the 1950s. And he initially wanted to like talk about the land seeding that was happening in the Southwest. And he Knew, he knew subconsciously that he wanted to do something to help Native peoples in his creative outlet, which was filmmaking. And um, he came across these young adults that he met in downtown Los Angeles. And he understood that they came out here through the um, relocation program. So he did this beautiful film about um, these seven young adults coming out to Los Angeles in the 1950s. It's 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 available, I think, online. It's called The Exiles from 1956. And I was here at UCLA studying film, and I was getting very depressed watching all these Western films of the Indian getting killed. You never wanted to be an Indian in these films. I didn't want to be an Indian after watching all these films. So I told my, one of my professors, and I said, I'm, I'm just, it's breaking, my, breaking me down. I said, I don't see any positive outlook of Indians in film. And he said, well, there's this film that's coming out. We had this um, restoration of this film, and I really think you'll like it. And because he knew that I was a big fan of neorealism films, and um, I, I saw it. Um, I was fortunate enough that I actually saw the premiere of the restoration of the films at the Hammer Museum, and I loved it, and it, it, it was my inspiration. It was kind of my kickstart to do the work that I'm doing, and that's what this image is portraying, is talking about the migration of American Indians coming to Los Angeles, and it's, you know, um, to remember that. And I wanted young kids to, to understand how they are second, third generation of natives living here in the city. Because a lot of these young adults um, don't even know how they came to the city. So I wanted to give context to, them, to, to their understanding of why they came to the city. And the second image um, 
what is it called? <laughs> yes. It's, well, this is a continuation. I'm actually interviewing young adults that are mix of mixed cultures and how one culture can dominate another. Um, the young lady that you see in the photo, she's um, half Lakota and half Japanese. And I did an interview with her, and she talked about how she loves the fact that, you know, she has a town here in Los Angeles that um, she can connect with, which is Little Tokyo. But she wishes that she also had a community where she could, you know, hang out with more Lakota people. She does know a lot of Lakota people here in, in Los Angeles, but... Um, she says sometimes that she, you know, she gets lost. And so some of the participants that I have, I have a young lady who, um, she's half Persian and half Navajo. And then I have um, another participant, his name is um, um, Daniel, and he is from the Mohawk Indian tribe in New York, and he's also Mexican. So I want to share those stories because those are stories that, you know, nobody really hears about, of how, how these people walk through life with an understanding of one tribe identified in a metropolitan city, but the other side is erased. And so those are just stories, and I continuously do stories, and um, I work with a lot of different um, outlets here in Los Angeles because I, I think it's imperative that our Native voices are heard and that our of who we are as human beings are seen. And so I do poetry events. I actually just came from a poetry event that I, I'm doing at um, the Autry. Um, I'm gonna be hosting it um, tomorrow. We have another um, um, event at the Autry, which is currently um, having their Indian market. And so if you wanna see a lot of different Indians, go to the, the Autry tomorrow and you'll see them. But I'm... I, <laughs> But um, I just thought it was important to really bring these d diversity voices. And so I'm trying to do things in a different settings. I do it through my photography, through my video, through poetry, um, any aspect that I can, because I think it's, it's important. Oh, yeah, thank you. You mentioned one thing. I, and I, I just want to mention one last thing, and then maybe we can open it up. I don't know how we're doing on time, because I haven't been keeping track. But um, you mentioned, you know, being here at UCLA, studying film and watching all of these Westerns and how painful it was. And, and when I'm working on repatriation cases in particular at, at the Autry and, and in other, other spaces, there's um, it's very painful research for people. And it leads me to think about how, for example, when we look at the missions, um, I think it's important for non-Native people to consider, is that or is that not painful for you? And why is it not painful, or why is it painful for you to research? You know, is the violence something that pops up right away, and how it might be different for an, an, you know, a native person to research those subjects, and uh, what, how does may that influence um, the work? Uh, so we we at the Autry we um, acknowledge that it can be very painful to come across, you know, boxes and boxes of archival material that uh, describe. Um, people in very horrific ways or um, illustrate violence or there's imagery that's very violent and then to be confronted with the very real um, material reality of, of, of that violence in the museum over conversations about repatriation and uh, how difficult it is for folks and how difficult it might be to to spend years studying something when you're confronted with your own community's history um, woven into, you know, a lot of these, a lot of the subject matter. So, yes, last comment. Yes. It's painful for me to write some of my poetry. And it's painful for me to document history through my writing and through my poetry. And, um, uh, yeah, that's something I think a lot of people should consider is how does it make you feel? I mean, do you look at it in a different, in a, look at it in a different lens? And if you don't, maybe consider looking at it in a different lens when you do your research and when you do your, 
you know, understanding of different um, artifacts or um, research, yeah. Okay. So do you want to show your video? Oh, okay. So okay. Yeah, I'm going to show one of my, my, my video poem. Yes. How does that work? I don't know. I think that's, that's it. Set fire in time for murder and order as in command. A day set before a trail of broken treaties was ever muttered a strand. I once lived on land where the word partition was never understood. I once lived when our language is beautiful, spoken every day, and never misunderstood. I once lived when our hair was considered sacred in our journal of life. I once lived when eagle feathers were the compass of life. I once lived when water was free, sacred, and a gift of life. I once lived with my people in a dwelling that was simple. I once lived without judgment of my brown skin because it was my temple. I once lived with family, cousins, and friends and understood unity. I once lived when relocation was not meant to forget who we are as a community. I once lived before our boarding schools punished us for who we are with the philosophy of kill the Indian, save the man. I once lived when alcohol was not in our veins, a bottle or a beer can. I once lived without the term red skin used as a delusional way of honor. I once lived before sterilization was an act of taking lives, leaving spirits wandering. I once lived before USDA approved diabetes was feeding our bodies. I once lived without IHS replacing our ceremonial medicine with antibodies. I once lived before white crosses plunged into our souls and our homelands like scorching knives. I once lived before forts and Fort Sumner corralled us like animal archives. I once lived without cowboys and Indians where the cowboys played the superhero. I once lived when Indian warriors were known as our true brave hero. I once lived before Hollywood used our native homelands like concession stands. I once lived when blood quantum was not known to drain our identity. I once lived before white settlers believed in the myth of manifest destiny. I once lived without reservation suicides, taking young, beautiful spirits, believing it was their fault. I once lived when our land was not tortured, raped, bleeding, and crying, and silence with asphalt. I once lived where our tradition was our religion. Today I live with pride. 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 As a Dakota Indian woman. Rummy Indian woman. Dene and Northern Paiute woman. Dakota woman. Navajo woman. Arapaho woman. Paiute woman. Cherokee woman. The Shoshone woman. Navajo woman. Washington woman. Dakota woman. I live and exist today. 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 I live and exist today because I remember how I once lived. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, of course, there are many questions, but time-wise and to give other people the opportunity, I guess I'll just ask one broad question. Um, could you, Lilian, talk a bit more about the process of institutional change at the Autry? Um, how long has it taken? What have been the main points of conflict? Um, what have you achieved so far and so forth? <laughs> yeah, good question. It's a uh, it's a constant process. Um, I think that there's the, the main point of tension, at least amongst uh, the museum and and communities, is repatriation. Is that we? It's 
it doesn't matter how many exhibitions we put on that are led by native artists or that involve native content or native storytelling, if we still have people's ancestors. Like we need to go through that process of repatriation and reburial and whatever it is people need. And in some cases when people maybe are federally unrecognized or they don't have a land base where, where they can rebury, we, we may have to be that place until we can um, you know, work with people to find, find somewhere um, for reburial, which is the case here in Los Angeles with the Tongva community. Uh, fortunately, um, you know, we have made significant uh, strides forward in that area. We had a, uh, um, Na the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or, or NAGPRA, right, uh, uh, is a process that describes how we're supposed to go about this. And for many decades, um, last three decades since, since uh, NAGPRA was passed in 1990, there's been uh, attempts by various people in the administrative structures of the museum to instill additional policies and procedures and processes that are not required by NAGPRA. Uh, and that slows the process down significantly. There's also been an extreme lack of investment in that process. So one of the things that I like to encourage people to do when they are uh, working with a museum is in, in asking, well, are you compliant with NAGPRA? Uh, yes or no. It's, it should be a yes or no question. <laughs> um, and you know, how many resources are you devoting to repatriation efforts? How many resources are you devoting to working with communities? Uh, because oftentimes it's, a, it's, it's still, for the majority of, of, of museums, it is a, um, re relegated to a very minor um, part of, of museum work when it's actually incredibly critical <laughs> to changing the institutional structure, to building relationships with communities. Uh, but that's, we've come a very long way there. Um, we're working on a very large repatriation that's going to be finalized next year, a set of 32 correct items, and all of that is now public information. Uh, and several more are lined up for the next two years, so um, that's, that's been a significant change. Also, we have a director, uh, Rick West Jr., who um, was one of the founding directors of NMAI, and he, it's been great working under him. I think having, being under his leadership has really uh, encouraged people to push the boundaries of what we feel comfortable doing and what we feel comfortable asking researchers of, for example, like this new policy we're developing where we're, at, we're going to ask researchers to work with communities in order to access materials that are um, related to those communities. He was very, it, when, we, when we first wanted to propose that, we were unsure about how it might be received internally um, because there, that had been a fight for years uh, where um, staff, some individuals wanted to make content available to everyone and without any tribal review. Uh, but when we proposed it, um, our director was very encouraging and he even asked us to go ahead and develop stronger language that would to communicate um, this new policy to researchers. So that's been also very encouraging. Yes. Um, well, in the last few years, I, I guess I've been trying to reformulate my conservation practices within intercultural uh, situations, especially um, regarding objects, indigenous objects and indigenous sites. And I think that it has, it's, it has been a difficult, a difficult path because there is actually no methodology for, for such an enterprise. And the success or the failure has been very different in, in, in any case. So I'm wondering to whether or not, and to what extent your museum has walked through this path of trying to reformulate or even restructure conservation practices regarding indigenous objects. Yeah, I uh, work very closely with our conservators. And uh, thankfully, I mean, they're in very supportive of, of repatriation efforts and any effort in working with communities. And they, uh, um, it's important for me to involve as many um, entry staff as possible in repatriation work uh, because it's not only is it, does it allow me to address like the archives that are associated with objects in the collection or um, make sure that uh, uh, materials are, are um, cared for properly and appropriately through, you know, and, uh, but um, the, the conservators, 
have really been, uh, they've taken a lot of initiative in making sure that they come to me with questions and I, when we will work together to connect with communities to figure out, you know, what might be the best way to rehouse an item, or what what might be an appropriate or inappropriate treatment, and um, and th that's, this is a long game. Like these are these are relationships that need to build over many many years. But you have to start somewhere. Uh, and in many cases, we have relate we have you know, hundred years of relationships with some, with some people, and in some cases, it's the first time that we'll, we'll be reaching out to folks. Uh, we do, a lot of it for me is like at the end of the day, I can have a really supportive uh, conservator or a really supportive archivist or a really supportive you know, curator or whatever. Um, when that person leaves, everything changes, right? And so it's important for me to have policies in place that make it um, easy to, to, uh, to work with communities and that encourage that collaborative work. But at the same time, policies in place that make it difficult to do the work without communities. You know, it's, it's got to be. It's got to come from um, from both both sides. And yeah, I think yeah, balance. Um, so it's it's really been about uh, in working together with our conservation team. Um, we've both learned a lot about how we do things, and we're both very willing to to change how we do things. Uh, to accommodate uh, tribal interests. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if, if staff can agree that the main goal is to develop these positive working relationships with tribes, then we'll do what we need to do. And it hasn't really been much of a, of a struggle. Uh, th there was an initial hump at first where just people were, were um, maybe anxious about working with tribal communities in the sense that they might, they were maybe worried that uh, they might get yelled at or scolded or, uh, you know, um, there's this kind of fear, anxiety, and you just have to rip the Band-Aid off and just like, you know, just, yeah, just do it. And maybe it is uncomfortable at first, you know, maybe you are gonna get yelled at, maybe you need to get yelled at, you know, and, and then you get over it and then it's fine. Uh, and um, there are, like I said earlier, like you are gonna make mistakes. We're all gonna make mistakes. It's about recognizing those mistakes when they're, when they're um, brought to our attention and working to address them and change them. Uh, so I, when I start having, when I've started having tribal consultations at the Autry, I've invited different um, staff members to participate and to be a part of that process and, and that's really impacted how they approach their work. Hi, this is Ilse from Mexico City. I, uh, uh, I find fascinating uh, that you share your stories and your personal and professional experiences. I, um, it is wonderful that you have created policies uh, and developed a system in which you collaborate directly with the tribe people and with the communities. And I was wondering how you measure the impact of these policies, like if you have a mechanism that measures how these policies have impacted the community or the people that work uh, or you collaborate with? Oh, that's a great question. We're not measuring yet, uh, but that's, uh, yeah, something that we definitely need to do. I think one, one measure for me um, in the work that I do is, is very straightforward. It's like, how are we doing on repatriation? You know, how are we working towards NAGPRA compliance? How many items have we uh, made accessible to tribal communities? Um, What's, how has the database been enriched by that conversation? What research are we supporting that is driven by Native scholars, that is driven by tribal communities, uh, and what they're interested in? Which, there's some amazing, fascinating research questions and projects uh, out there that, that we are um, working to support um, through the use of our collections. And uh, I think that, for me, that's, that's been a, a measure. We're actually having those conversations now. Um, we have a little task force uh, called the Resources Center, which is where we have the collection, where the collections are held, the Resources Center Collections Access ta Task Force, where we're trying to work out, um, build some of these policies and address things like how we measure, how we measure um, progress, um, because it is important to, to measure, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't really have a question. I, I would like to comment um, on things that are resemble the things you described uh, that are applicable to the Latinx community in, uh, in California and in Texas. 
Uh, I was speaking today with John Noriega, uh, director of the Chicano Research Center, and the things he described to me are, are strikingly similar to the things you are describing <laughs> right now about the institutional support of UCLA to the um, recovery uh, archivization um, of uh, the history and memory of the Latinx community in the state of California that it's uh, majority of the, uh, of the population, 40%. And yet uh, the institution, this institution uh, uh, lends zero support uh, in terms of, um, for instance, um, uh, acquisition uh, money. The library has no acquisition budget. Um, most of the collection comes from bottom-up uh, donations. Um, the, uh, uh, the status of the Hispanic Latinx community in, in uh, uh, the United States, and particularly in states like Texas and, and California, uh, is not unlike the uh, status of uh, Native Americans um, in general in this, in this country. It might come as a surprise to some of our friends coming from Mexico. Um, but uh, the, the degree of disrespect and dismissal and negligence uh, of the history uh, and institutions created by Latinx in general is, is remarkable. I could not, I mean, I could not believe the things that I just heard in, in, during lunch about how UCLA treats uh, the Chicano Research Center. Uh, it is simply remarkable. Um, and you can see uh, the, the, the interest in general uh, of, of, of the uh, academic community of uh, UCLA, UCLA about these issues in, in the turnout to this conference, uh, to issues that have to do with Native American history and to issues that have to do with Hispanic history in this state. Um, it's simply zero. Um, so, uh, it's, this is just a reflection. Uh, I've been struggling for the last 30 years in this country to recover a different memory of the history of uh, the Latino community in the United States uh, and in this continent. Uh, we have a history of tragedy, a history of failure, a history of... Um, uh, we have forgotten 80% of our history, literally. Um, and these narratives we have that we, we, we hand down to our children uh, are histories of, of, uh, uh, of failure, of tragedy and failure uh, that are reinforced by institutions everywhere, by history departments, by uh, universities like this, um, systematically, constantly, I just came from Tulsa. Uh, the uh, 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 Greece, Greece leader, I don't remember the name of this museum in Tulsa uh, that collects Native American art. Uh, was the, uh, initiated by a Creek, an individual of Creek origins um, who eventually left the, uh, the museum to the university and to the city of, Tex uh, of Tulsa. This institution has one of the largest collections of uh, archives of Inquisition archives from Mexico, 64 volumes. It has unique documents and unique books from the archives of the Inquisition. And this institution um, uh, acquired from individuals in Mexico in the 19th century who uh, the plunder the, uh, the commons of Mexico acquire this, this collection uh, uh, for, for, for nothing. Um, and now it's in Tulsa. And what is the purpose of that collection in Tulsa? To recreate, to reinforce this image of a, of a state of Hispanics as shitholes that created institutions like the Inquisition that systematically um, destroyed the entire communities, did nothing but create uh, superstition and and obscurantism, et cetera. So I, I just don't want, my point here is that 
what, is, what happens to the Native American community happens to the Latino Hispanic community as well at large. We are larger in numbers, we are majority in the state of Texas, in majority in the state of, 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 of California, and yet uh, we have exactly the same problems that you are describing here. No different whatsoever. No, that, that's a comment that I think has come up uh, in other other times I've sp spoken about these issues. Um, I I mean, I think we should talking about it. At the end of the day is, is, is you know, we're, we're living under white supremacy <laughs> and like many departments are struggling with funding and acknowledgement and, and there's values definitely placed on different people. Uh, and that's the fight we're in. But um, I, I do want to clarify uh, that there, there actually, there are many similarities um, between generally people of color in this country and, the, and, and, and many shared struggles, um, many of which have their roots in the experiences of, in, of, of Native American people here. If you want to look at the prison industrial complex, we have we look at indigenous communities. If you want to look at pretty much anything, it, it, the roots are with what's, what's happened to ind indigenous people. And although there are some overlaps and similarities, fundamentally, um, you know, Latinx people in this country, for example, don't, we don't have the Bureau of Indian Affairs looking over our shoulder at every moment. Like, the, there's, a, there's a very different political relationship um, that Native people have with, to the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, and I think that's critical to, to acknowledge, you know. 